Well, good morning, everyone. We are going to wait just a couple um, seconds here to make sure uh, everybody is uh, be able to join us online. So we know it's a little awkward switching from one um, online stream to the other. So uh, we'll wait just a couple seconds as people uh, people make that move. I hope that you had a great week. And we uh, certainly, uh, I'm glad that you joined us today. Uh, like I said, we're just um, waiting a few minutes here. I'm trying to actually pull it up on uh, another device so that I can make sure that uh, you guys are seeing me. But um, anyway, we're going to wait just a couple minutes and we'll get started. We're going to be in Habakkuk chapter 2 today. Uh, we started there last week, the prophet Habakkuk. Uh, is a great prophet for us to read today, um, especially in our season of being locked down and and uh, those kind of things. So I see that people are jumping over uh, to this new stream. So again, we're just uh, waiting a few minutes here uh, until everybody uh, has a chance to jump over to the new stream. Um, I pray that your week was great and that you saw God uh, working in and around you. Uh, I know that uh, the Lord is present with you and he desires to teach you and and uh, we're looking forward to uh, diving in uh, to his word again this morning. Hey, this week, uh, my wife and I watched a documentary. Uh, it was called Leaving My Father's Faith. It was the story of a preacher, uh, if you will, his name was Dr. Tony Campolo uh, and his son, Bart Campolo. Bart uh, was raised by Tony and his wife, Peggy, in a Christian home. And uh, Tony Campolo was a teacher at Eastern College, but a prolific speaker uh, all around the country and the world. And Bart was raised in his home. And ironically, uh, one of the things that intrigued me about the documentary was they were personal friends of our family. In fact, Bart uh, was my father's youth pastor at his church for a while. And this documentary was called Leaving My Father's Faith. In fact, Bart Campolo, when he got into his 30s, decided that he didn't believe anymore. He didn't believe in God. He didn't believe there was a God. He didn't believe in the Christian faith. Uh, he believed in nothing but secular humanism. And in fact, today he is the chaplain, the humanistic chaplain at USC, the University of Southern California. And as we watched the movie, um, it was interesting, as I said to me, because these were uh, friends of our family. But Dr. Campolo asked his son in the movie, the movie is a conversation between the two of them. And he asked his son, what would it take for you to believe? And his son said, well, I would need to see something supernatural. I would need to see like a man who had his arm amputated, prayed for, prayed for and his arm would grow back. That's what I would need to see. Well, the next day I was telling my mom about the documentary. She was uh, good friends with Dr. Campolo's wife and she wanted to watch the film. And so she watched it. And after she watched it, she came to me and she said this. She said, you know, I don't understand it because he said he would need to see something to believe. And we're supposed to believe by faith. I thought to myself, yeah, that's true. But we don't usually do that. I mean, we say we have faith, but do we really? You know, the other day I had a dream. It, it was kind of scary. I was dreamed I was locked down in this virus situation, and God plucked me out of it. And he planted me down in a desert. I was all alone. I was bare. It was hot. It was gross. I had nothing to drink. And I got to tell you, I was dying. And I thought, I'm not going to live another minute. And I called out to God, God, where are you? And God said, Scott, I'm, I'm right here. I said, get me out of here. And God said, well, I have a few choices that I can give you. First of all, there's a door right here you can walk through. If you walk through that door on the other side are $100 billion. It's all yours. You can use it whatever way you want. But just keep one thing in mind. I will be with you no longer. A hundred billion dollars. 
I mean, think about it. I wouldn't exhaust that money in my lifetime. I thought to myself, I could take the money. I could pay for my wife's healing. I mean, we could go on trips. We could have just an unbelievable adventure. I could help people like I've never helped them before. But God wouldn't be with me. Before I was going to make my choice, God said, I have another opportunity for you. There's, there's door number two. There's a house on the other side of that that's built into a rock overlooking the ocean and it is fully stocked. The house is worth $25 million. And what I mean by fully stocked is this, whenever you go to a cabinet for something, it will be there. If you pull out your last can of corn, the next time you go to the cabinet, there will be more corn in the cabinet. You will never need anything in your life. But if you choose that house, I won't be there. I thought about the house. We love living by the ocean. I mean, that's incredible. I said, God, are there any other choices? He said, yes, there's a third choice. You can stay right here in the desert with me. And just about the time I was ready to walk and make my choice, I woke up. And I thought to myself, what do we put our trust in? I mean, $100 billion or or a beautiful home overlooking the ocean, or would I prefer to be in a desert with God? You know, last week we started looking at the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a prophet in Judea um, and about 600 years before the time of Jesus. Habakkuk was a little different prophet because prophets usually speak to the people about God, and we said that Habakkuk was speaking to God about the people. He was speaking in a divided kingdom. There were 10 tribes of Israel in the um, you know, nation of Israel to the north that had been overrun by the Assyrians. And the two tribes to the south were very close to being overrun by the Babylonians. And we left Habakkuk last week climbing up into a watchtower near the gate of the city. And he said, I am going to watch for God's answer to my complaint. Well, We get God's answer this week. In chapter 2, we read these words. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place It will not be delayed. You know, I have a fantastic doctor I told you about last week. And when you go into his office, if you have a 2 o'clock appointment, you are not going to see him before 4 o'clock. You are going to wait. And the reason you wait is because when the doctor sees you, he takes all the time with you that he needs. He is fantastic. So when I go to his office, I take a book and I wait patiently. I know he's going to come through. I know he's going to see me. I know he's going to care for me. I have no doubt about it. I have faith in that doctor. And so waiting patiently is easy. But there are people in that waiting room that I realize this must be their first time. Because after about a half hour of waiting, they were unbelievably impatient. And they are complaining and they're yelling at the woman at the front counter. My appointment was 30 minutes ago, and they're waiting anything but patiently. You see, we struggle sometimes waiting on God because we're really not waiting on God. We're waiting on God to do that which we want him to do. We're waiting on God to do what we want. And when we don't get what we want in the time that we want it, we begin to complain. You see, if we know that, hey, God's going to come through. God is going to deal with this. God is going to take care of us. When we believe that in the depths of our soul, we can wait patiently. Well, Habakkuk goes on, or God says to Habakkuk, look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. God is saying, as you're patiently waiting, Habakkuk, live by the faithfulness that you have to God. That's what righteous people do. They live by their faithfulness to God. You know, this admonition 
is so strong that it's repeated throughout Scripture. Paul repeats it three times. Listen to Romans 1.17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. Hebrews 10.38. But the righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. What does it mean to live by faith? What does that really look like? We want to talk about that in just a few minutes, but I want us to look at what Habakkuk is told by God about the Babylonians, the people that are going to come to destroy them. God teaches Habakkuk something about them, almost as if to say, listen, if you're going to live by faith, this is what you're not going to do. Some of you probably know the name Jeff Foxworthy. He was the guy who would come up with all those things like, you might be a redneck if, and he would come up with all those little jokes. Remember that? Well, God seems to be saying, as I describe the Babylonians, I want you to understand, you may not be walking in faith if you hold on to some of the things that I'm describing about these people. So what I want to do this morning is take a look at six things that God shares with Habakkuk. And then I want to look at four um, kind of ideas about walking in faith. So let's take a look at what God says to Habakkuk. He starts off, he says, wealth is treacherous and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave and like death, they are never satisfied. In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many people. God first says this, Habakkuk, you may not be walking in faith if you live by arrogance and greed. Now, there's a fine line, my friends, between confidence and arrogance. And let me explain what I believe it is. Confidence is a gift from God. Confidence without introspection turns to arrogance. Confidence without introspection becomes arrogant. See, when I can't in my confidence look inside and say, you know, it is God that has given me this confidence. It's him who strengthens me. He gives me my ability. If I don't see that, I become arrogant. Man, I'm good. I knocked this one out of the park. I can do this. I can get more. Arrogance flows into greed. And we are not living by faith when arrogance and greed are ruling our hearts. God goes on, he says, but soon their captives will taunt them. God's talking about the Babylonians are going to take captives, and these captains, captives are going to turn on them and taunt them. He says they will mock them, saying, what sorrow awaits you, thieves? Now you will get what you deserve. You become rich by extortion. But how much longer can this go on? Suddenly the debtors will take action. They will turn on you and take all you have while you stand trembling and helpless because you have plundered many nations and all the survivors will plunder you. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled the towns with violence. We are not walking in faith when we have taken captives and we're sitting here going, okay, that's not me. I haven't taken any captives in my life. Hey, I want you to think about something. I'm talking to a man right now who's having a hard time believing that he's not a loser. He's having a hard time believing that, that he's not stupid. He's having a hard time believing that because when he was a little boy, he took some thoughts captive that people said to him, and he's held those thoughts captive his whole life. And those thoughts have now turned on him, and he is now living by those thoughts. You know, Scott, I'm stupid. You know I'm dumb. I meet men and women every day who truly believe that if they could just get in the relationship with the person they're trying to have a healthy relationship with, their security would be secure. They would feel good. They would feel safe, and they would feel secure. There's no doubt we all want a healthy relationship. 
but that's not where our security comes from. But somewhere, someone taught them that your security would be found in a man or your security will be found in a woman. And they have taken that thought captive and that thought has now turned on them and controls their life. What are the thoughts that you have taken captive that aren't true, they're not real, yet they control your life? When we allow those kind of things to control our heart, our decisions, our mind, well, we're not walking by faith. God goes on and he says, what sorrow awaits you who build big houses with money gained dishonestly? You believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nest beyond the reach of danger. But by the murders you committed, you have shamed your name and forfeited your lives. The very stones in the walls cry out against you and the beams in the ceilings echo the plan that echo the complaint. God says, you're not walking by faith if you find your security in this wealth, in your own personal wealth. But Scott, didn't, didn't you read the passage? It says that, you know, by, your, by the murders you have committed. I haven't murdered anyone. Hey, Jesus says we murder with our tongue. We tear down and we destroy with our tongue. And some of us have put so much security in our wealth we, we, we almost lost it when the stock market crashed, but now it's come back so we can breathe easy. We put so much security in our wealth that we can't be walking by faith. God goes on, what sorrow awaits you who build cities with money gained through the murder and corruption? Has not the Lord of heaven's army promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? The wealth of nations. They work so hard, but all in vain. For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of God. The earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of God. You know, I saw some pictures this week of the skies over New Delhi, India, smog-filled skies that are now perfectly clear. I saw pictures of, of polluted rivers that you can now see through to the bottom. I saw pictures of wild animals laying in the streets. The, the glory of God is being revealed as we have to hide from life, if you will. But God is saying here, you might not be walking by faith if you put your trust in governments, if you put your trust in, in ruling powers. I was having a discussion with my son the other day. He loves these kind of discussions. He asked me if I thought if he thought Jesus would vote. I said, no, I don't think Jesus would vote. I had a hard time explaining to him why I thought that, but basically it's this. Jesus came for 33 years, but when he came, and he came as a servant. He, he really didn't focus on that. He focused on serving people and showing us God's love. The next time that Jesus comes, there will be no voting because he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he will rule. And so I have a hard time figuring out a Jesus that would walk around in America today. The Jesus that walks around in America today is you and I. We are his hands. We are his feet. And I don't think that God puts his trust in the governments as much as he puts his trust in his family and his body. We are to see the needs of people and to meet them and to love them and to care for them. When we put our trust in governments, we might not be walking by faith. God goes on, what sorrow awaits you when you make your neighbors drunk and force your cup on them so you can gloat over their shameful nakedness, but soon it will be your turn to be disgraced. Come drink and be exposed. Drink from the cup of the Lord's judgment, and all your glory will be turned to shame. You cut down the forests of Lebanon, now you will be cut down. You destroyed the wild animals, and now their terror will be yours. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled their towns with violence. What God is talking about here is contemptuous living. Contemptuous living is when I tear someone else down to elevate myself. It's contemptuous. We do that with the people in our homes. We do that with, with um, people in our world. 
We do that from time to time. And when we have to tear other people down to elevate ourselves, we are not walking by faith. You know, God's people do that regularly. We used to like to refer to people that didn't accept Jesus or didn't believe like we believe. We'd say, oh, well, they're just lost. And we would tear them down with the word lost so that we could elevate ourselves. That's contemptuous living. And God says that when we do that, we're trying to elevate ourselves. We're not walking by faith. And finally, God says to Habakkuk, what good is an idol carved by man or a cast image that deserves you? How foolish to trust in your own creation, a God you can't, who can't even talk. What sorrow awaits you who say to the wooden idols, wake up and save us. To speechless stone images, you say, rise up and teach us. Can an idol tell you what to do? They may be overlaid with gold and silver, but they are lifeless inside. God says you're not walking by faith when you embrace idols, when you create gods in your own image. Do you know why we do that? It says right here, these gods can't even talk. We don't want them to. We want to control them. We want to tell them what to do. And sometimes we make Jehovah a God who serves us. And when we do that, we're not walking by faith. We are the people who serve God. And so you see, when you trust in pride or you trust in the, the, uh, the wrong thoughts that you have taken captive in your mind, or in your own wealth, or in governments, or in contemptuous living, or with idols. God is telling Habakkuk, these people are not walking by faith. And he says, Habakkuk, here's what I want you to remember. Here's what I want you to remind the people. Habakkuk 2.20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. You know, when I saw a picture of wild lions laying on the concrete streets, I thought to myself, the earth is silent before God. When I saw polluted streams that I could look down and see the bottom now, the earth is being silent before God. When we find ourselves in places that where we're not living by faith, God says, listen, remember, I'm on the throne and let the earth be silent before me. But if the righteous live by faith, then, then what does that look like? Hey, let me just give you four things to kind of chew on today. And hopefully you'll be able to join us after this message on the Zoom session. And we're going to talk about these things together. Here's number one. Faith is a gift of God. You know, a lot of times we think faith is something we muster up. Oh, I'm, I've got to have, you know, faith in this. I, I don't really want to, but i got to muster it up and have faith. Faith is a gift of God. And it's a gift that he has given to every person that walks this planet. Some of us haven't opened the gift. Some of us don't use the gift. Some of us don't believe we have the gift. Some of us don't embrace the gift. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is a gift of god not by works so that no one can boast you didn't muster it up you didn't come up with enough faith to believe god has given you the gift of faith you either exercise it or you don't Here's the second thing I want you to think about when it comes to walking of faith. Not only is faith a gift, but faith is a muscle. You never see those, those guys that are just kind of ripped in the arms, you know, kind of like me, you know what I'm saying? Just ripped like crazy in the arms, right? Those guys, you know, have been in the gym. They've been pumping weights with that muscle. They've been literally tearing that muscle down so that it builds itself up. They've been testing that muscle to its limit and it builds it up. Faith is like that. The more you use the gift of faith, 
the stronger it becomes in your life. The more you unpack God's gift of faith and you walk in faith, the stronger it becomes. See, if you're relying on, well, I believe in God, but I'm relying on my finances, you're not lifting weights. If you're saying, well, I believe in God, but I need to take care of my own relationship, we're not lifting weights. If we say, well, I believe in God, but but I also have these you know, contemptuous thoughts where I tear people down to elevate myself, we're not pressing the weight of faith. Faith, faith is not the weight. Faith is the muscle. But we're not trusting and using the muscle of faith. Galatians 5.16 says this, So I say, walk in the Spirit. You know, for me to walk in the Spirit, I have to trust God. I have to have faith in God. I'm walking in faith when I walk in the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In the book of Galatians, Paul is talking about this war that goes on between us where we want to do these things that we really don't want to do and we're trying to figure out how to stop doing them. Paul says it's simple. Walk in the Spirit. Keep exercising the muscle of faith. And as you do, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Faith is a gift. Faith. It's like a muscle. It grows like a muscle. Thirdly, I want you to see this. Faith has distractions. Faith has distractions. Remember the story where Jesus said to the disciples, get in the boat and go over the other side? I'll meet you over there. Well, Jesus decided to take the shortcut and walk across the water, and the disciples thought they were seeing a ghost. But Peter's like, no, I think it's Jesus. And he says, Jesus, if that's you, Tell me to come to you. I want to walk on the water. And Jesus says, come on, Peter. And Peter steps out on the boat, and we read this. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, save me, Lord. He saw the winds and the waves. They were distractions. And Jesus was standing right there. I mean, who wouldn't have faith with Jesus standing right in front of them? And there were even distractions to Peter's faith right there. We just talked about distractions of our faith. Wealth, thoughts that we have taken captive, a government, an idol. They're all distractions to our faith. There are other distractions that I think one of the greatest things we can do right now is think about what are those distractions and how do I remove them from my life? How do I focus on Jesus instead of the winds and the waves? So faith is a gift. Faith grows like a muscle. There are distractions of faith. And here's the fourth thing I want you to see, that walking by faith is a group sport. It's a group sport. In 1 John chapter 1, we read these words. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, if we claim to have fellowship with him, if we claim to, let's estimate, walk in the spirit, if we claim to live by faith, if we claim to, you know, believe in him, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, listen to this, it's very interesting. We have fellowship with one another. It doesn't say we have fellowship with God. That's a given. But when we walk in the light, when we walk by faith, we have fellowship. We walk in sync with the other members of the body. You ever see one of those parades where the marching band is walking in sync? Everything's in sync by the beat. It's what God is saying that when I walk by faith when I accept the gift, when I, when I use the muscle, when I turn away from the distractions, I unite with the body of Christ. 
You see, one of the reasons why the body of Christ doesn't have the unbelievable impact that I think God wants us to have in this world is because we're not united. We're so individualized in our idea, especially about walking in faith. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' Son purifies us from all sin. Friends, I can't think of a better time right now while we're locked down, maybe for this last week, to think about and to identify the distractions to walking in faith in our life. Are they our pride, our arrogance, our greed? Are the thoughts that we've taken captive and we now believe the, the wealth that we have, that we find security in? Is it trusting that the, the government will save us? Is it contemptuous living, tearing others down to elevate ourselves? Or have we embraced an idol? We're saying we believe in God, but we're trusting in an idol. You see, God revealed his purpose to Habakkuk. Habakkuk, here my here's my purpose, that you wait patiently in faith. While you're waiting, walk in faith, Habakkuk. Walk in faith, unpack the gift, exercise the gift. Steer, steer clear of distractions and be united to my body. We walk by faith not by sight. The righteous are united together because they walk by faith in the God whom we serve. Hey, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this prophet Habakkuk who speaks into our life even right now. And I pray, Lord, that as we discuss this with the people that we're watching it with or on the Zoom chat, whatever it might be, that you use your word to change our lives. We love you, Jesus. We thank you and we give you praise for loving us first. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hey, I hope you'll join us next week because we're going to finish up this small book of Habakkuk, looking at chapter three, where Habakkuk is, is really has some things to say to God, and I want you to hear them. Secondly, I hope that you can join us right now on the Zoom session. We're going to click off of here in just a second, and we're going to flip over to Zoom. Uh, you probably uh, either saw the link to the Zoom in the feed as I was talking today, or you can go to the Facebook page a couple posts down probably, and you will find the link for today's Zoom session. I hope that you'll join us in just a few minutes. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you real soon.